Hey everyone, welcome to the Stride to Freedom podcast. My name is Russell Benaroya, and I'm the co-founder of Stride Services, a virtual back office bookkeeping and accounting firm serving hundreds of clients around the United States. This podcast is designed to help small business owners focus on growth and innovation. In other words, focus on those things that inspired you to start your business in the first place. We call it your genius zone. We do our job on this podcast when business owners feel like they have the trust and confidence to build the right team of partners around them that will help them grow. Thanks for joining. Let's go. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Stride to Freedom podcast. I am your host, Russell Benaroya. The Stride to Freedom podcast is the place where we help leaders get and stay in their zone of genius. What is theirs, What is your zone of genius? Your zone of genius is that thing that you do as a business leader or owner where you really lose track of time, where you get the greatest amount of energy and fulfillment. And so often in business, as we toil away and all of the things associated with trying to get this business going, we get out of our zone of genius. And our responsibility on this podcast is to bring guests and expertise to help you find partners that can keep you in your zone. The Stride to Freedom podcast is brought to you by Stride Services. We are an outsourced back office bookkeeping, accounting, and fractional CFO services firm for MSPs and digital agencies. Our zone of genius is helping you use data to make better business decisions. Okay, let's get into the episode today. I am absolutely thrilled to be introducing you to my friend, David Sheehan, the managing partner at Athru Partners. Hi, David, how are you? Russell, great great to be with you. Thank you for inviting me today. I'm I'm looking forward to it. Well, it's really such a gift. You have have such an illustrious background in the uh, marketing agency space. For those of you that have not copiously researched David beforehand. He is a longtime entrepreneur. He ran for almost 20 years an agency that was ultimately sold to a private equity-backed group, which I'm sure he'll tell us about, in 2015. And I've interacted with David over the course of a couple of years as we've gotten to know one another, and I've been able to observe the work that he does for agency owners to help guide them on the journey toward realizing a great exit value for their business. And so that's really the purpose of today's conversation is how do we help digital agency owners get positioned and prepared for the unlocking of the value that they've created in their business, but aren't quite sure the path to take to get there. And David's going to help us walk us through from beginning to end and transition to increase the probability that you can, in fact, traverse that journey yourself. So let's uh, let's jump in, David. Tell me about the history of Athru and why you started the firm. Sure. Yeah, I uh, sure will. Uh, first of all, Athru is kind of a funny word. A lot of people always want to say, are you misspelling Arthur? And I always tell <laughs> them no. Um, um, my, my name being Sheehan, which is of Irish descent and heritage. Uh, my partner is a guy named Bill O'Donnell, who, who actually is a uh, is a resident of Ireland and and a uh, passport uh, or a dual citizenship of both the United States and and of Ireland. Um, Athru in Gaelic, which is the, the native tongue of Ireland, is the word for change. Uh, mm-hmm. And we 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 adopt. By the way, it's also a a, a very popular rock group in Ireland. Okay. Um, Athru. So some of you may know it from that. But um, but that little piece of trivia. The, the reason we selected that term really was uh, because we wanted to be change agents. You know, Russell, much, much as you, you talk about the, um, the importance, you know, business is all about changing dynamics all of the time and um, being able to navigate those changes and, and to understand when, when you need uh, additional help, when, when, when you need your organization to, to, uh, to step up in a different way, when you need to kind of pivot to new, new categories, new services. Uh, it's all about change. And, and we felt that we wanted to be agents of that change. 
uh, and helping those business services, marketing services, digital agencies uh, with the changes that they that that they undergo, and, and by using some of the knowledge and experience, and 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 I'm sure as Russell, you 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 probably often speak to is, um, you know, we've we've been able to 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 work with uh, uh, so many clients across uh, so many so many different sizes and shapes and configurations. Um, we've made mistakes. Uh, the mistakes that I made as a as a business owner, I've been able to kind of help some of those people navigate how not to make those same mistakes, which is which is can be a, a big contribution in being able to enact change quicker and more successfully. What are the circumstances, David, upon which a, a prospective agency client comes to you? What are they feeling? What are they thinking? What's happening with them in the moment? Um, it, it's, it really falls into kind of two camps. One is um, a, a agencies that are on the grow, uh, that, are, that are in a good place, that, are, that, are, that, are, that have good momentum, um, but, but they may not be seeing the incremental increases in revenue, um, and they may be somewhat profit, struggling a little bit with, with, with profitability. More often than not, it's really more of a revenue and growth issue. Um, they've done a nice job of building their business to four million or five million or ten million, um, but they get stuck. And 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 certainly, I, I have great appreciation for that. Uh, my my business ultimately got to about thirty eight million dollars in revenue, but I got stuck in several different different parts of the of the business. So part of it is 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 owners on the grow, and and that's what we really talk about is growth consulting. Um, and then, and then, part of the people that come to us are people that have reached that stage uh, of the business either because they they feel they've done everything they can do, or they need additional resources, or they simply want to go on to something else, and they're thinking about a potential transaction, and so they want to find out: Are they transaction ready? Do have they done the things? Does their business have any value? And we will help them determine that uh, honestly and carefully. Um, and, and if it does have value, we can even potentially help them then if they do want to transact. Mm. And, and by transaction, I mean a potential sale, a merger, um, you know, a divestiture of some other type, an internal sale to, to existing employees, all of the options that exist as relates to uh, a potential change in control of the business. Okay, so I'm hearing two paths. So one path is I want to I want to break through some barrier that's typically associated with growth. So I want to break through a growth barrier. We'll talk about that in a minute. Or I want to be on the track of preparedness to exit my business and determine whether or not I can position the company to realize an exit via a, a, a mergers and acquisitions related scenario. You said um, if they have done the things to be prepared for that possibility, that exit possibility. Right. Could you talk about maybe the the top five things that come to your mind when you talk yeah. about the things to be prepared sure, sure. for? Sure, of course. I, obviously, you know, fundamental and 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 critically important and certainly an area that that you you know and appreciate and understand the value of, which is financial stewardship, excellent financial stewardship. Uh, re really being able to understand what's driving your business, what are the financial drivers, what are the financial, what, what we call dashboards that, that you need to be using to determine some of the key steps that you're going to take to continue to, 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 to drive growth. So financial is critical uh, without, without any question. Organizational is another. Um, you know, many, many uh, smaller businesses can't afford the 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 luxury of a of a of an individual HR person and and so m many times their hiring practices and and all of those things tend to lag and and they struggle they struggle to get the right kinds of people they they struggle to retain people um, and, and so that that's a critical part of it is is how is your organization put together is it a sustainable organization is it a scalable organization. Um, Third is, is what are you doing from a growth perspective? You know, many businesses grow up and, and do very, very well by attracting what we call kind of the friends and family referral network. You know, they, they are really good at, at um, generating business from people they know, from former clients, from a client 
a, a, a junior client that leaves to go to another client and now hires them again. But where they struggle is, is when they're in a, a fair or, or equal, equal competition with other really either like agencies or agencies that are in a larger, larger class than they are. How do you win those? And, and then how do you know who, who to target? And, and where is the greatest value? We find that a lot of agency owners chase categories that in our mind doesn't have as much value. Obviously, the, the categories that have value from a buyer's perspective are those that they know are going to be reasonably consistent. And, and, and certainly nothing is recession, um, recession proof. But there are industries like healthcare, for instance, that are that have been kind of proven to be resilient and, and they're kind of recession resistant. Um, so marketing is a big part. Organizational is a big part. Financial is is uh, is, is a big part. Um, and then and then obviously there are there are you know other other dynamics you know in and in and around training of of people and and um, that that's a that's a key piece uh, for that. And as I mentioned really having a fundamental understanding of what are the services and or categories that I really should be playing in. And, and that's another area where, you know, you end up kind of growing up doing what you know. And then the question is, is, well, what do I need to add? And, and sometimes those decisions can be very difficult to understand what really brings value versus just additional cost. So we'll help try to help them identify that and help to steer them into the kind of verticals that we know are going to have high value when a buyer is going to come to call. David, I'm assuming that some clients come to you and have this this desire and and fantasy to make changes in their business that are going to either accelerate growth or put them in a better position to be attractive from an M&A point of view, but it does require potentially and very often a fair amount of organizational redesign a going back to the roots of what our value proposition is, maybe shifting in how we deliver products and services. So I'm assuming this is not necessarily for the faint of heart. What does a client need to be prepared for in working with a company like yours to really get the most out of doing so? Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's. I think that's really a, a really good point. Um, you, you know, I... I being open to change, you know, back to that word change again, being open to change is, is difficult, especially when even if your business isn't isn't kind of what I would call high performing, it nonetheless is probably performing to a level uh, that is providing you with a, a very comfortable living and, and, and you've reached a level of, of comfort level with even the size and the configuration and the services that you're doing. Um, but but you know it's the it's the old expression nothing changes if nothing changes, and and so yes I think that's one of the things that we have to to help help owners through which is is to be be prepared for what's the potential fallout. Uh, more often than not, it's it, it doesn't have significant downsides because many times companies that do come to us are stuck they're they're, they're stuck in the mud a little bit and, and so. Um, Better, better to 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 lose to lose ten percent of your business with the chance of potentially doubling it in the next three years on on the short on the short term. So, um, but but yes, if it is an organizationally driven changes, then that's where it really gets gets difficult. But many times the owners kind of know in their heart when they need organizational change. What they really need is is affirmation of that by by someone, and and we we can provide that. In some other areas of change, oftentimes it's kind of the the what what you don't know is what's holding you back, and that's where we can fill in those blanks. Mm -hmm. And talk a little bit about how you fill in those blanks. What is the method on how you yeah. work or approach a client that is uniquely Athru's to deliver? Sure. <laughs> Well, we have we, we have various ways of working with them, um, but one of the things that we have found, you know, through trial and error that 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 I think has been really successful is is we have a thing called the uh, attractiveness readiness assessment, and um, and even if a even if even if the agency is is still in kind of growth minded mode and not really thinking of transaction, although everyone. You know, what I have found is, is everyone has it in their mind and or as an ultimate goal 
that, that they would like to extract value from all of the sweat and blood and tears that, that go into their, into their business. Um, so I, I think the attractiveness readiness assessment that we've, that we've generated is a very comprehensive tool that looks at 70, 74 different kind of key, key parts of their business from organizational to financial stewardship to, uh, to, to the, the services that they offer, um, to, to things such as, um, you know, how often clients are changing over and why and all those kinds of things. This comprehensive overview kind of really allows the, 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 the founder owner to take a really good snapshot and a pretty objective snapshot of where the business is and how that business looks in comparison to other businesses of their size, similar configuration, et cetera. And um, we simply present the results. Uh, you know, we don't try to editorialize too much ab about those. And then we let the, 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 the owner or founder or executive team then kind of say, here are areas that we, you're right, we need to fix. We know, we've known, more often than not, they do know it. Um, they just have been reluctant to do it or they haven't felt they had the quote unquote time or it hasn't been a, a something of what they felt was urgent to do. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's the same for every business uh, business owner today, you're spinning, you know, so many plates, uh, you know, what is it you're going to do to, to, to kind of drive the business forward? And many times it's the thing that's on your, on your list for today. Right. And, and it isn't forward thinking things because you say to yourself, if I don't fix this, there won't be the forward. Um, so you kind of talk yourself out of it, but, but, uh, but our attractiveness readiness assessment has been super successful. And, and then we have a program, where we work with founder owners on a quarterly basis um, to do really kind of a report card on, on, a, on a lot of the key drivers that they should be looking at, but it's tailored really to the marketing services space. So it's not kind of a general kind of a business blueprint. It really is specific around marketing services and what we have seen in, in working with, you know, over a hundred clients over the course of the last five years. When you talk about the attractive readiness assessment, is that something that you make available to prospective clients on the front end as part of your process? Or is that something they only take once they've committed to working with you? Because I could see that being a really effective foot in the yeah. door to just baseline. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it normally is one of the very first assignments that we, what we're involved in when we come in to work with, with a client. Okay. And, you know, again, it, requir it requires the effort on the part of the of the ownership or executive team to fill it out. We, we make each individual do it separately so that so that we don't have kind of, you know, you know, again, uh, kind of group think shaping uh, the answers. Uh, and, and then we'll look at all of those. We'll we'll compile and consolidate. Sometimes we have to do some additional follow up. If there are if there are issues related to the client, we'll, we'll do a little bit of voice of the customer research. We'll take it. We'll we'll compile all of it, and then we'll overlay that with our our understanding and and kind of our best practices uh, counsel as relates to what we've seen in in areas. It's a it's a subjective rating system. It's on based on a one to five scale, um, but but we have pretty much a database that kind of shows what best in class agencies are performing at in those areas and how they're performing, and and if you don't fit within those those uh those quadrants then then in fact we'll flag that as an area that's probably holding you back so out of curiosity when you talk about the 100 plus clients that you've worked with over the years you use the term marketing services and that your focus is on marketing yep. services are there sub segments within marketing services that you could break down so that if anybody's listening to this and says yes uh, i'm technically in marketing services but more specifically i'm in uh, SEO, or more specifically, yeah. I'm in web design sure. and development. I'm curious how you think about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, you know that, that's a that's a good question. Um, and 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 I think you know as as all of the listeners will 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 certainly recognize the agency business has become a, a business of specialists. Right. Right. It, it used to be you kind of had kind of a generalized end to end integrated agencies, and today that's that's certainly you know not the case. And in fact. There's probably less demand for those integrated agencies. Uh, I mean, there's certain segments of clients that still want an end-to-end -end solution, 
Uh, but many times, you know, there's there's media focused agencies. Uh, and what 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 we we characterize them more as kind of performance media and marketing agencies, agencies that are that are focused on SEO, SEM, traditional media planning, buying all the strategy around that. How, how to put together the who do you want to reach in in the most effective fashion? Um, there are certainly content agencies and agencies that build out content and creative elements uh, can do can do video work. Um, there are agencies today that have become specialists at at various channels, uh, you know, the direct to consumer marketplace. Um, there are agencies now that specialize in that. There are agencies that specialize in influencer marketing has become greater. In fact, there were two transactions this week uh, from the largest holding company, WPP, that purchased uh, two mid-sized influencer marketing hmm. agencies, and 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 those agencies really do nothing more than 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 help source, uh, set up, and design the programs, and 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 develop all the content, and so they're end-to-end -end suppliers around everything to do with that influencer segment, right? Um, so, and, and then you know, even in the experiential area. Uh, we have several. We've had several clients that that work in product sampling or 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 even things like things like that where they're more specialized. So I, I think there's six or seven or eight categories. Um, one of one of the categories that that I think has become more pronounced over the last several years is are agencies that focus on one particular vertical. Um, you know, we are all about healthcare, or we are all about life sciences, or we are all about pharma or we are all about direct to consumer, or we're all about B2B. Um, so, so many times we can kind of segment segment based on that, that as well. But specialization has really become the, the watchword for successful agencies. And, and, and just again, based on what, what we've seen, agencies that are specialized are the ones that are in the highest demand, irrespective of, how, of what size they're at. So you can be a $5 million agency that specializes in influencer marketing and someone may want to come and buy you at a fairly aggressive multiple because they want to tack that service on and the ability to get clients and expertise and processes um, all in one fell swoop versus having to try to build it brick by brick makes a lot of sense for them. That may be the single most powerful takeaway from this podcast, which is Focus, 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 know your customer yes. segment. And while we all know it intellectually, it is so hard as a business owner to uh, to decline business mm -hmm. <laughs> that is outside of your segment because we also want the, the revenue. And so I, I appreciate you doubling down on that comment. Question for you around the state of the acquisition marketplace today. We obviously go through cycles and some cycles are, are hotter than others. Talk a little bit about the cycle that we're in today. And then specifically, what is the threshold? I'll call it kind of minimum threshold of financial performance that increases the probability that a, a deal can get done. Yep, for sure. Um, I, obviously, um, you know, everyone listening here probably can speak to this much better than I can. But you know, across the client segment that we have of of some some forty four clients currently, um, th there's economic headwinds out there that are impacting marketing budgets and 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 therefore impacting agencies uh, agencies growth. You know, we we had a couple of good years where there was pent up demand, um, and and so the year over year numbers were. Were really good, you know, and or the profitability numbers were were really good uh, for for uh, for a couple of years, even with the higher cost of labor. Um, this year has, I, I think, you know, we're seeing a more year over year numbers of, of kind of either flat uh, to up maybe very small percentage parts, you know, four four percent, five percent. That that therefore has meant that those people that are looking for purchasing or purchasing of, of agencies have become a little more selective be because the buying dynamics are really driven by, is this a business that is scalable? Is this a business that's demonstrating that it's scalable? And, and many times to, to your financial performance metrics, um, buyers want to see an agency that's performing at, at 15 to 20% annualized growth. Um, they want to see an agency that's 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 uh, that's performing at 
uh, a margin of between 25 and 30 percent. Um, you know, they, that those key dynamics, they want to see an agency uh, that that is in in services that are being utilized year over year. So so it's the recurring revenue, right, versus project work. So th those are the critical dynamics. 70 percent, you know, you want to have 70 percent of your revenue tied up in recurring revenue. Uh, 30 percent of it can be project and that that won't that won't penalize you. Uh, a growth track of, of 15 to 20 percent a year, which, as we know, there's always an attrition factor. So so you may have to be growing at 30 percent because you're going to lose six or seven or 10 percent a year, um, maybe through through no fault of your own. And, and then and then obviously um, being very, very cognizant of margins. Um, and, and again, this all kind of to me, it all kind of circles back to if you don't have the right dashboards, or if you don't have the right financial acumen to be able to understand those dynamics and to be measuring those dynamics on a month to month basis, you're you're putting yourself in jeopardy. Not, not only you're putting your business in short term jeopardy, but you're jeopardizing the opportunity to potentially ever sell. What I'm hearing is unless you have the instrumentation to be able to know how you're flying uh, and where you're flying to, it's a little difficult for you to not only run your business, certainly difficult for other people to look at your business and assess it in a clear, logical fashion. For sure. I, I think yeah. you, you stated that correctly. Yeah. It's, it's difficult for the owner to operate it. It's impossible for an outside buyer to, to, to potentially, re, it's impossible and, and, and improbable that yeah. they would ever look at a business that doesn't have that information. So I'm hearing 15 to 20% top line growth. I'm hearing 25% EBITDA margins, earnings yeah. before interest, yeah. tax, depreciation, and amortization. I am hearing specialization and I'm hearing recurring revenue, ideally representing about 70% of your top line. Okay. Whew. And what about in terms of just call it minimum size? Like when do things start to get interesting? Do we need to be at seven figures yeah. of operating profit? Yeah. Um, it, usually again, yeah. When when you have a million dollars of, of, of profit, there, there's, there are at least some interested buyers in that. And again, it, it depends on the audience. Private equity firms uh, who are adverse to risk, even though they, they tell you they're not, um, uh, you know, and be, because they're using other people's monies yeah. oftentimes to make these transactions. But, um, you know, the, the ideal candidate for them is, is you've got $10 million in top line revenue. You have, uh, you know, three and a half to $5 million in EBITDA. Um, and, and um, you know, and your business has been stable for the last five years and growing on the right direction. And you're in the categories that they're most interested in. So, you know, that 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 bullseye doesn't come along very often. So so there has been some shifts on that. And I have seen agencies as small as six million dollars who are specialized in services, uh, six million dollars in revenue. So that's 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 not gross in, you know, gross revenue, right. gross revenue being, you know, adding in all the pass-through expenses sure. or production and or, or outside media costs. I'm talking about $6 million to an agency that might have an EBITDA number of about $2 million, somewhere in that area or a million and a half. Uh, and if you've got the right basket of services and you have the right kind of client list and the right kind of vertical, they may look at you as what they call a bolt-on uh, potential opportunity to an existing platform that they've already begun to build. So we have seen activity in that area, um, but but underneath those, then I think it's a very opportunistic marketplace. There are some agencies that will come in to look to buy you. Many times agencies don't have the financial resources. If you're an, if you're an owner that, that says, I'm not gonna sell my agency unless I can receive 70% of my, of the value of the, of the transaction at close, then many times you're not going to sell to an agency because they often want to uh, provide you with an earnout of over a two or three year period of time based on performance metrics and or give you stock in in a newly configured company that is the combination of the of the two entities that are being pulled together. So um, an outright sale means 
you know, that you, it, you have to have the right financial dynamics to be eligible to, 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 to the buyer segment that could potentially have the financial resources to provide that for you. Right. Okay. So what I'm hearing is if you're in the, call it six to $10 million of net revenue, right? Net of the pass through and gross ups, et cetera, yeah. range, you're in the seven digits, ideally in the two plus million dollars of EBITDA, you could be perceived as what we call a platform acquisition. Maybe a buyer comes along in a, a strategic, I'm sorry, a financial buyer, right? Like private equity yeah. money might come along and say, oh, let's use that as the foundation. Otherwise, you're probably going to be subject to a bolt on, which you could be in various cases of size where you're getting strategically acquired for that unique capability that you provide, whether it be your customers or the specialization. And that's really where focus, focus, focus assigns a premium value because people are willing to pay for that unique niche that you seem to own. Exactly correct. Okay. Um, so thinking about through and how you guide in that process. If I come to you and I say, hey, I, I think I, I, I either have today the attributes to be a, a bolt-on or a platform, uh, but I might be a year or two away, or maybe I'm not, and I'm, I'm really ready to, to traverse the journey. Where, How do you guide them end to, end to end? Are you going out to the market and finding prospective buyers? Are you negotiating term sheets? All that. Yes. So, so we, we would start with, again, uh, at the very least, if we don't do a full attractiveness readiness assessment, which which to some degree is a surrogate valuation okay. of your business, we we would do a we 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 bring in someone to help us do a reliable financial valuation um, for for that owner, um, which can give them a range that kind of shows again similar businesses within their. Uh, within their subset of how they're performing. So, and then once that's determined, if it is determined that that it that it is buyer eligible, then then yes. But what we would do next is is help them put together what's called a confident confidential information memorandum, a SIM, um, and and that really is kind of a a a a, a very um, a comprehensive look at the agency with a with a with a with a strong uh, point of view about what this agency does extremely well and why a buyer should be attracted to it. Um, and it includes, you know, information on, on, on critical players, on key accounts, on financial dynamics, on the work that they've done, um, uh, on the accolades they've received, all, all of those things. Um, and, and we would in fact go out to selected, we have, a uh, you know, several lists of both private equity firms uh, we have we have lists of what we call strategic buyers. They could be you know printing firms or consulting firms or other firms who have looked to to make acquisitions of marketing services agencies. Um, and then we have a list of other agencies, uh, either holding company based or or just independent agencies of enough size where they are primarily creatively driven and would benefit from having a performance media marketing team attached to it. And, and you go to them and say, you know, does this make sense? It's the, you know, the expression is, is where, where does one and one equal four? Mm -hmm. um, so, so the answer to that question is, is yes, we would, we would help on the valuation. We would help to build out both the SIM from the SIM. We would do a, what's called a teaser. We would then go out to a selected, highly curated list. We would see where the interest is. And then we would help the, the seller in the negotiation of, of the right terms and conditions. And we would also try to qualify the buyer in advance because as you can imagine, all of this takes a lot of time and energy and effort. And you don't want to be distracted in, in, in all of these conversations when in fact you've got a business to run. So we can qualify the buyers if the buyers don't have financial terms, 70% down, 30% you know, in earn out or in equity. Um, if they don't meet those parameters, then, then we never get to the next conversations. If they do meet those parameters, then we'll 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 set up introductory meetings. We'll do the NDAs, and then we'll begin the process. and And we can guide the due diligence if, in fact, it gets past those first two or three introductory get to know you meetings. If I'm an agency owner and I'm ready to go down that path with you, what what should I be prepared for, and how should I be thinking about this? Because there are no there are no guarantees 
T's, obviously. Right. And yep. am I looking at a wholesale exit of the business and I'm like living in Zwat Nail or something? Or am I am I taking another swing at this, but just part of a bigger sandbox? How do you guide? Yeah, I, I think for, for, for most founder-led businesses, I, I think the one thing you have to go into it with is an understanding uh that that to some degree the buyer is buying you. Uh, so, so therefore, um, this would not be a situation where, uh, at close, you, you know, you hand them the keys and they hand you a check, and 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 everybody goes their separate ways. More than more than likely, um, you're going to be a part of the business for at least a two year period of time, potentially a three year period of time, um, in which you would transition the business. You you need to be able to continue to be as committed to it as you were before, but just to begin to think differently about. The, the opportunities for growth if in fact now you have additional financial resources that that surround you and uh, I think that was the one thing that I I learned but it but it is a difficult transition you know I was a business owner a marketing services agency owner for 25 plus years um I did sell my business to Baird Capital a private equity firm um and suddenly now I I had a boss um <laughs> I had a board that I answered to, and and it and it does change the dynamics. I also had a lot more financial resources, so you know if I wanted to go out and make an acquisition of another small bolt on, you know where whereas at that stage of life I wasn't willing uh, to commit my own money to those kinds of transactions. I suddenly now had a new a, a, a new sandbox to play in. Um, so th there's a lot of pros. There are some cons, and. Um, and again, most most founder owners are entrepreneurially driven. They have a vision for their company. Uh, that vision does change. It doesn't. It doesn't necessarily mean it upsets it completely, uh, but it but it does change. And 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 I always kind of begin conversations with people who are interested in selling to says anyone that comes to us from a buyer perspective that says nothing is going to change if we buy you is immediately we walk away from that we walk away from that situation because they're not being honest because it will change. Mm. David, last question for you. What advice would you give to agency owners that might be listening to this and thinking about whether or not they, they want to take this next step? How can they, how can you help them, uh, organize in their heads where this this fits in terms of priority of all of the things that they have going on to keep the plates spinning in their life and in their business yeah yeah i, I you know I, I think it's um it, it's obviously a complex question it depends you know very much on on life stage of, sure. of the individual and 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 financial condition and some of those things but but at the end of the day, you know, we, we always start with the, the you know, the axiom, you know, start with the end in mind. You know, there, there has to be a really a strategic, there's a, usually a strategic reason that you'd want to make a transaction along with a financial reason to make the transaction. And if it's strictly financial, uh, then, 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 you know, it's probably going to be a struggle, to, to be quite honest with you. It has to be strategic uh, because the... The strategic part of it is what's making it fit with with the buyer, and what the buyer is really gaining is is an opportunity to grow your business exponentially at a rate that potentially you were not able to do. So, um, it, it does require. I think it's a very personal decision, uh, but it's a very strategic decision, and I think you you're, you're smart to use counsel and guidance from good financial resources from from consultants like us. Yeah, and or others, there are other other folks like us uh, that can do that kind of work as well. Um, and and certainly, again, you know, your own personal family uh, and 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 those kind of considerations are are critically important because life does change. Uh, many times, it changes for the better for people who sell, but in some cases, uh, there's a loss of control and and a and a, and a and a loss of something that has been very much important to you and and I I know many founder owners that feel that loss very very severely uh after after uh, after transactions and ultimately in fact I spoke to someone today uh who sold his agency 4 or 5 years ago to a holding company and ultimately decided to buy it back it it, it ended up not being a really good transaction for the holding company and he, even at an advanced age 
uh, he had decided to buy it back and now is transitioning it in a different fashion uh, with employees rather than, than than through the holding company. So uh, that that speaks to a little bit of the of the landscape and complexity of of that of that of that decision. Well, I really appreciate you, David, for laying out the realities of this of this journey, even in the best case of scenarios, even when you are growing 15 to 20 percent a year, even when you are generating 25 percent EBITDA margins, it's still a complex decision. And so if I wanted to learn or if people listening to this wanted to learn a little bit more about Athru and the resources that are available by working with you, can they just go to your website and do you have some resources available? Okay. Yes, yes, they can. They can go to you know www.athrupartners.com, yeah. um, and and feel free to reach out to me directly. Uh, and and if again, if there's questions that I can't answer, I'm certainly certainly willing to put you on to other people or other consultants that can help you. We have lots of resources out there. Uh, we work with really good folks, um, and and we only will take on opportunities with with new clients if we really feel that there's a real added value. Uh, for that client, if we can't do that, then at, at, uh, we're not a we're not a sixty person firm. We're not going to take it on, um, and or on the transaction side, if we're not reasonably confident, uh, and I would say within a within a a, 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 a percentage of about sixty to seventy percent that we can find a buyer, uh, we also would not take on that transaction. There are firms that that are more dealers. Uh, that will just kind of put you out there with a million people and see. We don't, as I mentioned, we believe the strategic fit is every bit as important as the financial fit. And if those two things aren't put together, ultimately it's not a successful long-term sale. Mm, David, it's one of the things I've always appreciated about you. I think you lead with very high integrity. You are a clearly a give first entrepreneur and consultant. And so I would, uh, uh, highly in, endorse that anybody that comes to you to learn whether they engage you or do not engage you will right. walk away with something of value to help them drive their business forward, which is really what the Stride to Freedom podcast today was about, not just as we understand about getting ready to sell your business. It may be on the journey of achieving some of these growth targets first before you're in yes. the luxurious position to have the privilege of looking at some of your financing alternatives. And you helped lay that out really well, David. Thank you. Th th thank you so much, Russell. Really been a pleasure to be with you today as always. Thank you, David. And thank you everybody for listening to another episode of the Stride to Freedom podcast. We will see you next time. Have a great day. Bye.